I would have given a great deal to have browsed this scrapbook when I was researching my novel, The Rose of Sebastopol, because it is so rich in images and clippings, and so beautifully captures the public's obsession with Florence Nightingale during and after her extraordinary expedition to nurse soldiers wounded in what was then called the War in the East, but we call the Crimean War, fought against Russia between 1854 and 1856. The scrapbook was compiled by Llewellyn Jewett, a Derbyshire man who at the time of the Crimean War was editor of the Derbyshire Telegraph. Scrapbooks these days are out of fashion. Most of our images and snippets about the news tend to be online. We scan them and move on. But in The Rose of Sebastopol, one of the heroines, Mariella Lingwood, who is the ideal of Victorian young womanhood, with her dexterity with the needle and her love of the home, keeps a scrapbook when war with Russia breaks out in 1854 because she wants to record British triumphs. Victorian ladies kept scrapbooks as a substitute for life itself. Their role was as angel of the house. They were required to be mothers, wives, sisters, and above all, supporters. Therefore, there's a sublime paradox in the story of Florence Nightingale, because for the first 33 years of her life, she had fought against her family's attempts to turn her into the ideal Victorian young woman. She was bored, resentful, restless, craving a life beyond the wealthy homes in which she was brought up. And yet the first image in this scrapbook is of a woman who is very far from home. It's an engraving produced and circulated in March 1855 and in it a lady holds a lamp which illuminates her profile, her white cap and a row of beds disappearing into the distance. All faces are turned to her. A doctor administers to one of the patients and at least two other women are present. One hands a patient a cup of tea. It's from images like this that the Nightingale legend was born. It's worth lingering because there are so many telling details. The gloom of the hospital, unhygienic cracks between the paving stones, the infinite number of beds disappearing into the distance, and yet that one brave figure slightly inclined towards the sick man. And she's a symbol of absolute self-control. She's the angel of the hearth, alighted in the Crimea to salvage the reputation of the British government who had sent their soldiers to battle without making any adequate preparations for the care of the sick and the wounded. A clipping for the Derby reporter perfectly highlights the paradox of Nightingale. Whilst the ministrations of the wife, the sister or the mother are usually bestowed upon one or a few individuals and performed within the hallowed precincts of the home. Miss Nightingale's operations embrace a wider field, upon a foreign soil, among strangers, persons of the opposite sex, to prosecute which she has had to exchange the luxuries of life for the luxury of doing good, encouraged and supported by that perfect love of her noble mission, which extinguishes every sentiment but itself. Note how the author of this piece crushes all opposition by referring to Nightingale's noble, even saintly calling. But there's a wonderful cartoon in Punch of one of Nightingale's nurses, published as she sets out for the Crimea in October 1854 that reminds us that her expedition was low-key and even the object of ridicule at first. How could 30 women possibly make a difference to the thousands dying in the battlefields? I love the detail in this cartoon. The camp stool, the umbrella, the patterns, which are wooden shoes for wading through mud. The cartoon also hints at the reason why Nightingale's family were so violently opposed to her being a nurse, because this was the popular image of one. Low-born, uneducated, probably drunk, 
spot the bottle poking out of her carpet bag. In this extract from The Rose of Sebastopol, Rosa, who longs to join Nightingale, turns up to be interviewed by the committee of ladies who are to select suitable candidates to accompany Florence Nightingale to the East. Timid cousin Mariella, the narrator of the book, is her chaperone. But when at last we were shown into a formal parlour where four ladies, each wearing an austere morning gown, were seated at a round table covered by a green cloth, it dawned on me that we were for once in a situation where social contacts, youth, enthusiasm and beauty were of no value at all. Rosa was doomed to disappointment. There was a distinct atmosphere of suppressed impatience and I sensed that the ladies, having glanced at us, had largely withdrawn their attention. Lady Canning, whom I had met at various charitable functions, said, Miss Lingwood, what a delightful surprise. How is your dear mother? You're surely not come to volunteer your services. No, but my cousin Miss Barr would like to be among Miss Nightingale's nurses. The distinguished eyebrows shot up into the frill of her cap. One of the other ladies sighed. Rosa sat in the vacant place at the table and a lady introduced her as Lady Cranworth entered her details in a book. What is your age? I'm 24. Then you are too young, said a Miss Stanley at once. She was the youngest of them all, perhaps in her thirties, with a prominent nose and bulging eyes. Surely youth is needed to endure the hardships ahead. I know that we shall have to work long hours and that there will be none of the usual comforts. I don't mind any of that and I've never had a day's illness in my life. You are too young and too attractive, my dear, said Lady Cranworth. Have you any idea of the kind of peril that you would face being amidst so many common men, most of them deprived of female company for months on end? Have you ever been in a hospital ward? I have. You would be eaten alive, Miss Barr. We are sending at great expense a party of nurses to relieve the suffering of thousands of sick men. Miss Nightingale is adamant about the type of lady she is not prepared to take. You would be seduced within a week, and then we would have the worry and expense of caring for you and shipping you home. I'm sorry to speak so bluntly, but there are, of course, other ways in which you and your cousin might consider supporting us. We are in great need of money and of bed linen. Please, said Rosa. You tell me I am too young and attractive. Well, I do know how to manage myself among men because I was brought up with two stepbrothers. Could I not speak to Miss Nightingale in person? She is a family friend and I know that she is herself a very attractive woman. Here she had made a bad mistake. Miss Nightingale is 34 and has the backing of the Foreign Office itself. Miss Barr, your going to the Crimea is out of the question. No further notes were made. Miss Stanley sprang to her feet and opened the door. Good luck, my dear, in whatever enterprise you finally choose. I'm sure that with your great spirit, you will succeed in doing magnificent things. There were now six or seven women waiting in the entrance hall, who stared at us avidly as we walked past, heads high, and stepped out into the square. Nightingale was up against the opposition of the entire male establishment of the British Army. She knew that every step she took would be scrutinised. Not all her nurses lived up to her high standards. But look at this highly fanciful image of her just a few months later than the Punch cartoon, by which time news of her work among our heroes of the East had got out. Note the crucifix and the veiled head and the carefully embroidered cuffs. The realities of what Nightingale faced were cruel. The hospital in which she worked was an old barracks and the conditions appalling. She wrote home that they were steeped up to their necks in blood and the lack of facilities was desperate. Not a sponge, not a rag of linen, not anything have I left. Everything is gone to make slings and stump pillows and shirts. These poor fellows have not had a clean shirt nor been washed for two months before they came here and the state in which they arrive from the transport is literally crawling. I'm getting a screen now for the amputations 
for when one poor fellow who is to be amputated tomorrow sees his comrade today die under the knife, it makes impression and diminishes his chance. This dedicated down-to-earth nightingale is beautifully reflected in a page of letters that she wrote to widows who asked her if she could discover anything about their missing husbands. Dear Mrs Lawrence, I was exceedingly grieved to receive your letter because I have only sad news to give you in return. In order that I might be sure that there was no mistake of name and that there were not two men of the same name, I wrote up to the colonel of his regiment who confirms the sad news in the note I enclose. And though he is mistaken in the precise date of your husband's death, there is no mistake, alas, in the fact. I wish to get this reply before I wrote to you. Your husband's balance due to him was one pound, two shillings and fourpence halfpenny, which was remitted home to the Secretary of War, September the 25th, 1855, from whom you can have it on application. The care with which she replies in this type of letter is phenomenal, and it's this close attention to every last detail that was to enable her to apply herself to reforming army hospitals, and indeed nursing in general, on her return. To my modern taste, this practical Miss Nightingale is far more appealing than the myth. And as the legend of Nightingale grew, so do the very syrupy tributes in her name. There were songs written about her. Daughters of Christian England, go on your work of love. Prayers wait round you from earth below and blessings from above. There's a dance named after her, complete with steps, the Nightingale Vas of Yana, and even a steam clipper, which will carry its passengers to Australia in under 60 days. Meanwhile, Mr Dewitt, compiler of this scrapbook, had been busy perpetrating the myth and published a pamphlet entitled A Stroll to Lee Hurst, in which he invites readers to join him on a walking trip to view the house or nest, as he calls it, in which Nightingale was bred. In ever more flowery language, he describes the surrounding countryside and villages. It was a Sunday, but for all that, it seemed a perfect miracle to us, that in a place where upwards of 500 living souls are daily gathered together in the two manufactories of the place, not even little children were to be seen peering out from the windows, and their busy little fingers playing about the brightly opening flowers. He concludes they're all at church, and conveniently overlooks the miseries of the lead smelting works and the factories in which they must have worked. When Nightingale came home, she crept back to Lee Hurst without any fanfare. The Derby Mercury concealed its disappointment that there was to be no bunting or brass band at the station, with a flowery tribute. The heroine of the Crimea, who went about doing good, whose every motion as she passed through the long lanes of sick beds at Scutari was watched by the loving, almost worshipping eyes of stern, rough men who blessed her as she passed, returns to her quiet Derbyshire home as quietly as if her two years' absence had been nothing more than a two weeks' visit to a friend. And this also is as it should be. We should have expected that Miss Nightingale would have shrunk from any noisy display and are not surprised to learn that she took precautions against the time and manner of her arrival becoming publicly known. But the local press was keen to contribute to the Nightingale Fund which was set up in her name and the scrapbook contains a long list of contributors and how much they paid from two shillings and sixpence to thirty pounds. Because Nightingale's work had only just begun the Englishwoman's Journal publishes a list of her own statistics in which Nightingale proves that if you join the British Army, even in peacetime, you had almost double the chance of dying than if you'd stayed home. And in this there are really sad resonances with our own time when we track statistics of infections and deaths and respond by clapping on a Thursday night and dipping deep into our pockets for Captain Tom's fundraising appeal for the NHS. We want to do anything we can to help. 
One of the very last exhibits is from the Derbyshire Advertiser in 1913, concerning the plan to set up a Nightingale Memorial in Derby. I can't resist ending with a quote from the Longfellow poem, written in 1857, that's reproduced in the article, and sums up the journey that Nightingale had made, from rebel daughter of Lee Hurst to national icon. Lo, in that house of misery, a lady with a lamp I see, pass through the glittering gloom and flit from room to room. And slow as in a dream of bliss, the speechless sufferer turns to kiss her shadow as it falls upon the darkening walls. As if a door in heaven should be opened and then closed suddenly, the vision came and went. The light shone and was spent.